Hello and welcome to Melbourne where the hair just keeps getting longer and longer and longer. But we're winning, we're surviving. And what a cool place to be tonight with some of the most amazing people in Australian television. But first up, I want to say a big thank you to Film Victoria. We love their support and we couldn't be doing this without you. And of course to Acme, because they let us gate crash their YouTube once a month, every first Thursday. And we love them for that as well. Now tonight, the whole point of the discussion tonight is to get people to think bigger. As somebody who's going to be on the show soon, um, said that formats are, are ways of making money while you're sleeping. So what we're talking about tonight is how you can take a small idea and you can make it so big that it goes all around the world. And we've got really amazing people to talk to us about that tonight. Um, first, I'm going to introduce you to Chloe Rickard, who's from Jungle Entertainment. Hello, Chloe. Welcome. Hi, Denise. <laughs> Thanks for having me tonight. A pleasure. And Dave Barber, who's co-creator of The Block. And um, hi, Dave. How are we going? Good. And of course, the ever-blooming, glorious Maz Farrelly, who's sort of like format queen, knows shed loads of people and <laughs> lover. Love it a bit. And you have to, you know, she's got so much to say. Awesome. And joining us soon, we hope, will be Deb Stewart. She's the um, quiz champion, quiz queen of Australia. She's apparently in the studio creating the latest Channel 9 version of Beat the Chasers. And she's just going to gate crash when she's ready because that's what producers do, I'm told. So, and also joining us from L.A., but one I prepared earlier, is Nathalie Wogue. And she's, her job, she's hired by all the big networks in Europe and the USA to go find the latest formats. She's to know the zeitgeist, to work out what people want. So we're going to start first with Maz. How could I not? Um, because she, you said, and we've been promoing this today, that you like formats like a men menopausal woman likes gin. So yes. can you explain briefly because we haven't got all night. Oh, really? Oh, what a shame. Uh, I, I love formats. So I had a job at the BBC in 1999 and my boss was a guy called David Young. I love David Young. And uh, he said to me, I want to give you this job uh, in the entertainment department. And I'm like, oh, I don't really want it. He said, why? And I said, I just don't think the shows are very good. And he said, great, neither do I. What we're going to do is we're going to reinvent BBC Primetime. We're going to come up with endless formats and we're going to sell them. So I don't want to buy anything. I want to sell, 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 sell. So our job really was to come up with formats that we could sell around the world. And we went from something like BBC Worldwide went from something like 3 million to 30 million in a year. And it was really from format sales. So that's why I love them. They employ lots of people. If you create a really good format, it can go around the world and you can, you can keep it going for ages, forever. You think about the number of people that something like Big Brother has employed, enormous numbers of people. I love quiz shows. So Weakest Link came out of uh, that time at the BBC. And the famous line, you were the Weakest Link goodbye, is because I was meeting my friend Rachel Tatton Brown for a drink at seven, called her at 10 two, and I said, are you ready to go? And she said, I've got to write a line for Anne to say to get rid of the contestants. And she said, I think I'm just going to put you're the Weakest Link goodbye. And I went, great, see you in the bar in 10 minutes. And that's how that one happened. Uh, I love that. That's crazy. It's absolutely true. But I tell you what was interesting about that. I will be brief. But one thing that I loved about it was everyone thought differently. So there were lots of quiz shows around at the time and they were very, come on down, very jazz hands. And we kind of went, why don't we make it the exact opposite of that? Make it dark. And don't have a host that's really jolly. Let's do the opposite. Let's have a host that's a bit miserable, to be honest. And if the geography teacher is on and the geography teacher doesn't know the source of the Nile, why don't we say, how dumb are you? Because you're thinking it at home. So we did what everyone else was doing, but we sort of did it, we did the opposite. And I think that that's a really, really smart thing to do with the format. That's awesome. I love that. So I love the weakest link, actually. Um, it's a bit cruel, but I do love it. You're the weakest link. 
Denise, goodbye. So, okay, I'm moving on to, <laughs> I'll move on to Chloe now because when we think formats, we think quizzes, we think Big Brother, we think the block. But what I don't think people realise is that you can create formats in comedy and in drama that can travel the world. Chloe, let's um, actually, I think what we might do just before we get into you, we're going to play a little clip here from Jungle Entertainment Showreel. Um, which sort of shows a range of some of the shows that you've sold around the world, and I think people will be quite surprised. Okay, great. We were friends. Our kids, they're still friends. I know. But in the end, our kids will leave us. So our lives have to be about more than just being mothers. Stokes, take the shot! And did you have a siren on during a stakeout? Uh, fun fact. Do not talk to me. We're here to dig a hole. Wait, we're actually digging a hole? I thought it was code for something. What would that be code for? Something not bullshit like hole digging. It's a shame you can't marry your mother. We'd make a lovely married couple. Oh, that's, that's weird. That is weird, Mum. That is very weird. Oh, my God, that clip. That, that's awesome. I mean, Mary Mother, a uh, hello. Um, before I go on, I have been reminded that, in fact, Beat the Chaser is Channel 7, not Channel 9. Slap. So, sorry, back to you, Chloe. Um, but you said that those two ideas, particularly with um, No Activity and Squinters, were, you know, they did come from something small. So can you – oh, we've just – Joined by Deb Stewart. Hello, Deb. Nice to see you. I said you were going to gate crash. Lovely to see you. Um, those two ideas did come from quite small ideas. Can you talk to that a little bit, please? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, so obviously uh, both of them are narrative comedies, but I think the unique element of those two shows is that the form, as much as the story, um, creates the unique format for that show. So no activity in particular um, whilst it is a narrative comedy, it's very much a series of two-handers. So when we were making that show, um, the focus really was about allowing, you know, great comic performers the room and the space to be able to ad-lib with each other. And the whole show's concept grew out of that. So basically um, it is a series of two-handers. We have very limited location moves, very limited camera moves, and it's all focused on the dialogue between the characters and the comic sort of ad-lib interactions that come out of that. And so um, we basically, we started with a 10-minute pilot that we shot in the basement of our office in Darlinghurst. <laughs> Not very glamorous at all, I have to say. Um, and with that pilot, we were able to demonstrate basically the essence of what the show was to stand the, the network in in Australia that picked up the show um, and then it went to, to multiple seasons here. So that was really how that idea sort of started. Yeah, it was a very, very humble beginnings. And so did, when you're creating shows, did you think about that as being a format or was it, was that a focus when you were developing those shows? Yeah, look, not not the the prime focus, I have to say, but um, my my very brilliant business partners um, are, are writers and directors, and um, their very smart minds often go to places where um, the form of the story is as equally important as the content. So they also created a show called A Moody Christmas, um, and similarly, I, I feel that that you know, so each episode is twelve months apart. It's sort of a, a Christmas every episode, um, and inherently too, that has um, you know, the narrative drama element, but also a really kind of clear formatted idea. So that's just where their, their brilliant minds go when they're, when they're conceiving new shows. It's, and we're going to talk a little bit later about how the differences are when you take it to another marketplace and all of those things. But I think that, you know, that must be very popular now as a production model, uh, very self-contained, very reasonably priced, I imagine, and budget. So is it gaining in popularity do you think 
Yeah, we've had a great run with no activity. It's um, it's gone to multiple seasons in the US, and um, it's currently I think actually one in Europe just went to air last week. Um, but the format's being uh, it's been sold in multiple territories in Europe and Asia, and they're all sort of going into production at the moment. Um, I think uh, people are looking for cost effective shows right now because it does have limited um, locations and limited camera moves, um, and you're able to shoot basically what would normally be a six week show the Australian version we shot in nine days I think for the first yeah. season so it's really kind of economical from that point of view I think the American version of the show they didn't shoot in nine days but it was still markedly shorter than than um, say a 10 episode comedy would be over there so that's one key thing I think the other thing is um, in in these times with with COVID people are looking for um, shows that you can shoot in a way that's contained and because um, again of its limited limited resources um, required to actually make the show that the crews are small the cast numbers are small and, and the location moves are small so it's got a really small footprint so um uh we're just in the process at the moment of um uh doing the same thing with squinters in the u.s and i'm hoping that the that it'll, it'll get a bit of a run on at the moment because of those limited sort of production requirements well, I hope Jackie Weaver's in it because she is a bloody legend <laughs> in that clip because she's yeah. so funny. <laughs> uh, we'll talk a bit more about how it's made soon. But there's nothing small about the block, which is the next thing we're going to talk about. I mean, that is one huge, mega, enormous success. Um, Dave, I want to ask you, it, I know that it came out of a little idea really comparatively because you've been working in the lifestyle space and you've been working on changing rooms, which in comparison to the block is incredibly tiny. But I'd love you to tell a story about how that show came up and how you developed it. More importantly, how the hell you pitched it and went to buy the apartment within about five weeks of pitching it. I mean, it was gobsmacking. Tell that story. I want to hear it. Sure. Um, so so um, my co-creator of the block is Julian Chris, um, and he'd been a senior producer on 60 Minutes. So come from a very different world to me. I, I'm sort of like drama, lifestyle, all those, those sort of things. And we got put together by our boss at the time to make a pilot, which wasn't on the block. It was some other pilot. We got on really well. And he came across to make Changing Rooms. And uh, we used to shoot that on a Tuesday and Wednesday and then we're sitting down on a Thursday and just having a bit of a debrief, really. And it was kind of like, what's next? You know, we've done rooms, we've done front yards, backyards, whole houses, um, all that. And, and there was kind of, well, what, what, if, what if you did do an entire block of units, you know, to it? It was kind of an offhanded gag at the time. And then we're kind of, well, hang on, there might actually be something in that, but what's the content of it? And... Like when we made even a small show like Changing Rooms, we would stress, you know, and, and just be sweating bullets about getting the sparky there to do his stuff, to get the builder there to do his stuff, the plumber, you know, all, all these things that were the magic of television uh, back then. You never saw that. It just, woo, it all, it all just happened. And we're like, bugger that. Let's push all that in front of the camera and let them deal with the stress of it and, and make it as real world as we can because this is how people really do have to renovate and you know add to that like in the first series they, they actually had to still do their jobs you know they, they still got up and went to work during the day so the only time they could renovate these places was before they went to work when they got home and on the weekends like it was it was really hard you know for for them to do it but we figured that there'd be drama to be had in just that everyday thing and watching how they live and how they go about it so we thought okay we're onto something here we need to pitch this idea. So we rang uh, who was our combined boss at the time, Peter Meekin, um, who's an incredibly clever man. And uh, we, we, we called him and we set a meeting for the following Tuesday at, at 10 a.m., knowing full well that the um, sort of high-level development production meetings happened at 11 a.m. So we wanted to be in just before he went upstairs to do that. Uh, we then set about writing it and like literally just every waking hour from Thursday through to Tuesday, just refining, 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 refining it as much as we could to the point that like we'd, we'd only have a paragraph a page and we would have larger font for key words so that even if you looked at that page and just looked at the larger font, you understood what the concept of that paragraph and what we were trying to get to. So it, it was just like doing 
everything we possibly could to make it make it simple and succinct. Um, and then, you know, we've made a few pilots for um, for nine before. Um, they were great pilots, but because we worked for them, there was no urgency. So they just get put in the top drawer. So we were, we were kind of like, okay, fuck it. We're going to make something that they can't pilot. They're going to have to make the whole series. And this is the one, you know, you, there's no piloting the block. You, you start, you go, and that's it. In fact, you have to buy a building. You're in with us. We're going to make this show. So that was kind of our concept. So how do we get it to who we need to get it to? We, we printed the entire thing on A3 paper so that Peter couldn't file it in his, in his cabinet and he couldn't put it in his top drawer and had to sit on his desk because his was kind of like the central hub where all the key executives would pass and converse and do all that sort of stuff. So we're like, okay, that's, we'll do that. Uh, we went and did that meeting. Um, we pitched the show. Um, that was at, at 10 a.m. He went upstairs at 11, still fresh in his head, brought it up in that meeting. They called us the next week and said, can you do a, up a budget? And then um, we were looking for apartment buildings in the next two weeks. And about a week after that, we had a signed blank packet check in our pocket to go and buy uh, uh, an apartment block. It, and, and it was at that point that we went, how long can we hide if we write five billion on this check because we, we knew we could cash it but we got sensible and we didn't do that we bought the apartment and there was a there was a the whole, apartment block the an apartment, apartment block, block yeah. yes <laughs> but there was a whole financial model that went with this because when you when you're pitching ideas to a network it's it's kind of like you need to have these trigger points so that they understand that if we're going to invest this money this is where the drama points are going to happen yeah. right because I, because i can't show you a part, you have to trust me that these are trigger points in which it'll be emotive. It'll, people will laugh, they'll cry, they'll, they'll do, do whatever, you know, we, we were hoping that they will do along the way. So from a business point of view, I mean, sets would, were costing about $2 million back in the day. For big shows, it was about $2 million bucks to build a set to do a, a big art reality show. Um, we bought the first block for $1.98 million, so just under two. In Bondi, can you believe it? That that's in two thousand three, mind you. And the point was, you buy this set, and and thankfully at the time David Gingell was um, was new into the into the role as CEO there, and he understood real estate really well. And he was from Bondi, and he understood that even if he if he gave us the money to purchase his block, and we never made the series, he's still going to make fifteen percent. And, and sell, the, sell the block and move on from there and, and, and away we go. So for, from a business model, I understood that. The other thing was the pricing. So the block has given away in excess of $22 million in prize money across its 16 seasons, right? Mm. So one of the greatest giveaways of, I think, any reality show worldwide, I think, uh, for, for that. But the network has only ever have to invest in $1.6 million over 16 series. 16 series. They only have to put up $100,000 in prize money, which they can get sponsored anyway. But our model was, you know, whatever they make above reserve, we simply take that money and we hand it to the, the contestants. You've covered your cost for the building and, and, you know, through sponsors and everything else, you've covered your cost to bills. And at the end of the day, we're, we're not in the real estate business. We're we're in the television business. That, that's that's what yeah. we do. Yeah. But it was a really solid business model that they understood. So it mitigated a lot of risk for them along the way as well. It's an amazing pitch story. Before I forget, you can uh, text your questions in to 0468 328 374 and they'll pop through to me here and I'll feed them in. So feel free. Wow, that's just amazing. I mean... Pitching, Maz, I mean, pitching formats, that's a classic, isn't it? Do you know, I was about to say, do you mind if I say something? And it is this, the reason that David is still in business and uh, a genius is because he's a genius. Mm. When you produce, when you're a producer, you have to produce your pitch. So think about every single thing that will get it over the line. You don't just go in and tell them the idea. You've got to make it really sexy. In the first 30 seconds, you've got to hook them in because that's your primary real estate. We are notoriously bad at listening, people in TV. My attention span is like a three-year-old that's had a lot of chocolate. I mean, it's just zero, which is good. Not good for the people around me, but good for work. 
Uh, and I think produce your pitches. Have a think about that. You know, David was really strategic about that. He produced the pitch so beautifully. Yeah. Go in at 10, their meetings at 11. Make them want it. Why do they want it? Why is it good for them? What's their problem? How are you solving it? Why are you a safe pair of hands? You're a safe pair of hands, my God, you know, given your background. Uh, we always do this thing where we always bring too many cakes. Uh, and we do that because at the end, what happens to the cakes? They go into the kitchen. You go in, you go, there are cakes. How lovely. So, you know, how come there are cakes? They go, oh, uh, Maz was in. Oh, what was she in? She was pitching. Oh, okay. What was it? And suddenly your pitch has gone viral. And virality is obviously, as we all know, if you're not in the room and someone's talking about you, you know, you're going viral, 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 viral. Mm -hmm. So have a think about how you pitch. The story goes, I'll be very quick, uh, and I won't tell this terribly well, but uh, when uh, CJZ went in to pitch, I think it was CJZ, a can of worms, that they thought rather than go in and explain what a can of worms is, which is very difficult to explain, they went in and one of the first things they said was, uh, we could tell you what a can of worms is, but we thought what we do is actually play the game, play it, make the show happen in front of you. And they said this, is it racist to say that black men have bigger penises than white men? And someone said, yeah. And someone said, yeah, but it's a compliment. And they went, it's a racist compliment. And then someone said, is it possible to have a racist compliment? I don't know. And they said, welcome to Can of Worms. Ah, oh, perfect. Great pitch. <laughs> Beautiful pitch. If you're going in to pitch an idea, know about the people you're going to pitch, do your research on them, know what worked last night, what didn't work, uh, know what they're looking for, and produce your pitch. And if you produce your pitch the way David produced your pitch, there's a potential that you'll have your block in, you know, 400 years time, but it'll still be going and everyone will be watching it. <laughs> I love it. Um, I'm going to come to you in a minute, Deb, because, thank, you know, I know you've been busily working away. I'm just going to ask Chloe a quick question, though. How did you pitch to take your shows overseas? Yeah, so um, with... Uh, the US version of No Activity, um, actually the writer, creator and director of the Australian show went over to the States. And um, I, I think that's quite unique in that he actually then went on to write, create and direct the US version of the show alongside the other co-creator, Patrick Brammel, who was the lead actor in the Australian show, who was also cast as the lead in the US show. So it's a very unique situation whereby the Australian creatives are actually very um, key and central to the US version of the show. Um, and really, I think uh, for us, the Australian tape uh, has been the best pitching tool for all our international versions. And I think yeah. in doing so, we're not just selling the concept, but we're also selling um, the voices behind it. And I think that's why the, the US, for example, has been so receptive to, to our Australian creatives over there because they're buying the voice as much as, as the format of the show. And um, I guess as we then have started rolling out um, no activity in, in other territories, um, alongside the Australian tape, we've put together a really extensive, I guess, production Bible. And then I've been talking, you know, at length to the creators in those territories, to the producer, to the director, to the writers even, um, about how we made the show and what the special source was um, in, in that original Australian version. I have to say, um, you know, just, just going back to the idea that it's the Australian sh version of the show that's actually really sold it, uh, many of the territories just really have loved the original version which I guess it's a, it's a credit to the, to, yeah. to the original actors and and the creators involved in that show but that has been the thing that has won the sort of the hearts and minds of of the the creatives in those other territories yeah that's great Deb, can yeah. I just, in there just really quickly um, sure. uh, just uh, on on that thing of having something to show um is 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 just so important um uh, along the way we we pitched a show, in, Julie and I pitched a show in the States. We were in LA and we pitched it to ABC um, and it was a cooking show and um, it, it was off paper, which basically they said we never buy anything off paper, but we were relentless with it. Uh, they called us back with our, with our agent at the time and, and they, they uh, brought us into the room and it was quite fun. They said, look, we'd really like this idea, but we want you to do a taster reel. But 
we're just going to we're just going to preempt this by saying we don't have much money to give you for this taster reel. Right? <laughs> like there is no money to make this taster reel, but we want to do a taster reel. We're like, sure, okay, that's fine, but be clear there's not much money to get we're like that's fine tell us how much you got they said well we want it to be seven minutes long and we've only got two hundred and fifty thousand dollars <laughs> and jules and i went Woo! we can we can <laughs> it's going to be tough but we're going to work with two hundred fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> we got in the elevator and our agent was outraged like he was i cannot believe these people would you know give you such shit money to make a you know, and we're like dude be calm you know, like 250000 is an entire episode in Australia. Don't worry about it. And that's exactly what we did. We took that 250000 and we made an entire episode. We took it back to ABC. Unfortunately, they didn't ever uh, pick up the format, but NBC did based on the reel because we could show a full reel of a full episode of how it actually played out as opposed to, yeah, yeah, because a lot of the time when networks are watching a taste to reel, it's kind of like, yeah, I get it, but... Will that really happen across an hour? You know, will you yeah. really have those cliffhangers? Will that really happen? And this is like we're showing you what these cliffhangers can do and how this story works across an hour, and that's what got it sold to NBC at the end of the day. Oh, that's amazing cultural difference. Half a million bucks or quarter of a million bucks. Thank you very much. Now, Deb, you've been sitting there wasting patiently. I do... I <laughs> um, I'm, the, I'm still at the office and everyone else has left. You probably notice I'm getting I'm sitting be sitting in darkness soon. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, I'm very glad you can join us because I don't think anybody in Australia knows more than you about quiz formats. And also you've you know you've created your own shows um, with Fox Sports. I, I want to ask you though, how like what's the key components for you? of a successful quiz show because it's terribly easy to go oh we'll just make a quiz show but they're bloody hard aren't they well they are and the devil is in the detail you have to get it right you you can't ever have anybody the integrity of the questions is really important you can't ever have uh, any any flaws in that process but I think it's it's like everything it, it, it's it's the core idea and the fact that people can play along with it but but in every, the same as in everything, it's the execution. You have to get it right. And it's got to be visually very, very good to watch. It's got to feel a bit sumptuous, like everything else that, you know, like the blockies, like a Chloe's dramas are. You've got to really enjoy immersing yourself into it. So visually it's really important. That's a big part of the execution. Then it's got to be really simple. You have to be able to play along and you've got to enjoy playing along. So... It depends on the audience as to what degree of difficulty you want, how much fun you want, how serious you want it to be, etc. The show that I've just been making today, The Chase, I think is probably one of the perfect formats because it has humour and it also showcases intelligence and it's got pace. We have the fast question round, we have the multiple choice rounds as well. So to me, it's a really simple, simple format that looks great has room for humour in it as well and has a, a fantastic end game. And in a quiz show, your end game is everything. You've got to have a great end game. It's all got to build to that. And so there'll be people watching tonight who have got quiz ideas. I mean, what, what do you say to them? Because it's kind of hard to get a, an original quiz show up, but where would you start if you had an original quiz show idea? Well, mine was born out of necessity. I was working for the original Fox Footy channel and they just said to me, we want a quiz show. Went, oh, okay. And so I just started working around questions about practical ideas, about stunt things. Like we had a, a and it's trial and error as well. We had things like uh, whose sports bag is this? And we just stuffed it full of things that we thought would be clues. Some things worked, some things didn't. Any successful quiz show has probably had two years of development in it. It, mm. it. it isn't an idea that someone came up with last week. The more that you play a game, the more variables you come across. And that's a really important thing too. So if you have an idea for a quiz show, start playing it. Play it with your friends. Play it with everyone. And you'll start to see all the different anomalies and all the different outcomes. And through that, you'll start to refine it. And so I guess the, the, the basic idea of a quiz is what you start with, but 
you know, when you think the weakest link or, you know, a, make a millionaire, they then have lots of sort of gimmicks that go around them as well, don't they? We prefer to say spin-offs. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm not very political. I'm like, whoa, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but that, but that's a very good point because I think, um, and it probably applies to, to any format, understand your format, know what the heart is, know what is too much for it to take because I, I've been fortunate enough to work on a lot of uh, shows that have run for years. We, we're currently in the fifth year of The Chase now. I did nine years of deal or no deal, opening cases, yeah. you know, yeah. and it's about knowing how you can keep that fresh, keep that alive, but don't break your format. Understand what is one step too far, you know, when you've, you may be moving into another territory and often you'll have networks say, we want to, we want you to do this special or we want to combine, cross promote this show. And it's, it's really hard to find a balance there, but you have yeah. to stay true to your format, what the yeah. heart is of your format so that you don't actually damage it. There's a, there's a thing that I say um, to probably too often to my team, and that is complacency is the enemy of a long running show. Yeah. And I think that's really important because you can become very complacent if you have a successful show that's ticking over, you constantly need to be thinking about what you can do and how you can refresh it. Yeah. Good it's advice. like marriage, isn't it? You've got, to, you've got to work at it. You've got to keep tweaking it and keeping it alive. Otherwise, yeah. they die. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, the block's been amazing at that too. I've got a couple of questions here, actually. From Chris, how does someone get into a position to pitch an idea without an agent? That's probably one for you, Chloe. Oh, no, I mean, it's for everybody, really. But, Chloe, do you want to answer that? Uh, how do you pitch without an agent? Um, you probably when, I've heard, yeah, when I've heard pitches in the past from people that haven't had agents, it's often been from YouTube creators. So they've actually started um, their own channels and, and made their own content and, and sort of, you know, I guess bypassed uh, the step of having the agent by showing, you know, their concepts and their ideas. Yeah. So Maz, do you want to come in there? Uh, yeah, I think that you have to create an amazing one pager. Uh, to David's point, you know, you can't ask that is genius. Now you could, if you had the idea, which is a genius idea, I was getting very cross when other people come up with really good ideas. I hate them for that one. It's so clever. Uh, if you shot that on your iPhone, it would work. That's how good that format is. Yeah. Uh, so I think a really good one pager, ask these questions. What is it? Can you describe it in one sentence? This is the sentence that uh, I think his name is Fintan Coyle, the guy who sent in The Weakest Link. He was a doctor. Yeah. He's now a very rich doctor. And he sent in one sentence uh, when I was at the BBC and a guy called Howard picked it up and said, this is good. And it said, this is a quiz show. And at the end of each round, you vote off the person you think is your greatest competition and could beat you or the person that's holding you back and is the weakest link. And he yeah. said, this is a quiz show. But it's a quiz show with strategy. And that makes it different. Yeah. Why is it different? What's the unique selling point? Why now? Why are you a safe pair of hands to make it? You yeah. know, why are you a safe pair of hands? Uh, what are the problems with the network? How are you solving them? If you can answer those questions, then you're probably in a good place. Your one pager is everything. Have a brilliant one pager, great title, great one liner, great visual, great paragraph where you explain all the stuff that I just said. And then you're at least in the game. And I love that point that you made too, Chloe, as well, which goes on with Maz, really, because in a way, if you can show what you've done by put, you know, by making something, and and Dave, you talk about that a lot too, as advice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that is the thing, you know. You, the amount of people who've told me their their geniuses, and I go, great, show me what your genius is, and they go, well, give me a job and I'll show you. I go, no, no, show me and I'll give you a job. Yeah. You know, it's you, 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 you have to, you have to just get started. You have to just start shooting stuff, refining your ideas, making them work, and then you've got something to show people. You know that 
I've made endless pilots in my life, you know, and, and, and I can say that not one of them has been a waste of time because I've learned what shit for starters, which yeah. is a really valuable lesson to learn. What works, what doesn't work. To Maz's point, you know, or sorry, to, to, to Dev's point, you know, are you pushing it too far? Are you going over the edges? Who's your audience? You know, what are you aiming for? So people really, when they come up with these things, they scatter guns so wide because they're so terrified that, the, that, that whoever's, you know, accepting the pitch, you know, might be thinking this way or that way. So we're going to go this wide with it it's kind of like just make the story work make the idea work and then it's about finding the right person to make it you know yeah. because it yeah. can be a brilliant idea and a lot of people won't want to make it but yeah. that one person who does that's the person you want and also it's about finding a market which um to 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 buy it and i'm going to bring in the first clip i did with natalie wogue um, we may only get to one clip tonight, but I should say that next week on Media Mentors Australia Facebook page, there'll be a big long interview with Natalie explaining a lot about the marketplace in America and how to and how to get into it. But um, if we could play the first clip, because I think that the big new player that in this whole game is um, Netflix, and we hadn't really thought about them as a buyer of formats. But let's have a listen, please, to what Natalie says. What's super interesting uh, is, you know, the, the latest formats launched on the streamers uh, like uh, Amazon, Netflix. And the, one of, I mean, the, the first example would be the circle. Uh, and the reason why uh, I'm highlighting this format is because, you know, it was, uh, um, it, it was launched uh, uh, just before Midcom. I, I think it was two years ago and uh, immediately uh, bought by Netflix. And at, okay, I mean, okay. at that time, Netflix was more uh, uh, known for, you know, buying scripted series. And so it was a big, big shock for also for the market because, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 traditional, the traditional channels weren't able to buy it. It was really, they bought it really just before the market. And, um, and then they, they actually, they produced it and successfully, it was uh, really, uh, the, the, the format itself was super interesting. And, uh, and it was just the beginning of, uh, you know, um, a series of uh, launches, uh, like uh, uh, Nailed It, uh, Marie Kondo, uh, lately uh, Floor is Lava, Too Hot to Handle, um, I mean, a lot of them. And, um, uh, and lately, uh, they also at uh, Edinburgh uh, Festival, they also, uh, you know, talked a little bit more about their strategy. They're looking for a game show, a talent quest. Uh, so on one hand, they are actually, uh, uh, you know, speaking as any commissioner would do. But at the same time, they say that, you know, they don't have this, uh, this problem of, uh, uh, I mean, they, they can launch uh, you know, whatever series they want, they can test everything. They can launch, you know, all at once or in batches. They can do whatever they want, actually. And, um, and because they understand that, uh, you know, viewers need fresh content, what the viewers love to do is just, you know, uh, at dinners, for instance, say, oh, what did you watch lately? I mean, what, you know, yes. they, you know, I, I yes. love to say that it's like they are like spoiled kids, you know, and they want <laughs> something fresh all the time. And the streamers are able to do that, you know, to test things and to test territory by territory. They get the data, they get, and so that's, that's definitely interesting. And, that, and for the producers, um definitely also i mean it means a lot of opportunities so what what's your thinking on the sort of marketplace for formats in in your experience do you think it's a growing i mean I, you know i suppose in a way it's kind of ironic that we're talking about this today when when there's a lot in the industry are feeling comprehensively screwed over by the announcements today on um on quotas and things from the government and I suspect that means that formats will be even more desirable. But what do you think is the sort of future for Australian formats in particular? And I'm just going to throw it open. So whoever wants to go, go. I'll go first if you like. I think that uh, what I've noticed, because I've worked uh, in London, LA and here, that in LA, when you walk into a meeting, people think, are you the person that's going to make me rich? In Australia, you walk into a meeting and it's a bit of a feeling of, are you going to end my career? 
And I take that very seriously because I think, yeah, if you have a, if you commission the show that doesn't work and you give someone 20 million to make it, it's a really big deal. And I say to people and they say, why don't people buy, why don't networks buy new ideas? I say, okay, you're starting a restaurant and you have the choice between Coca-Cola, other soft drinks are available, or my new cola, which may not work, but it might do because I've made other colas and they've all worked somewhere in the world. Are you going to buy Coca-Cola? Are you going to try the new one? You're probably going to buy Coca-Cola. Our job is to make sure that they try our new cola. So we have to come in at the right price point. We have to give them to everyone's point, something that makes them feel very safe. You know, how can I make you feel safe? When David uh, bought the block, they were going to make 15% on that. So win, 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 win. I mean, it's genius, isn't it? You know, it's so clever. Chloe didn't go and spend 18 million uh, shooting no activity. She had a really, really smart price point that was affordable, didn't make anyone afraid. So I think, think about all of their fears and try and allay their fears and think about something you can sell around the world. And if you can develop it with a network, that also really helps. That makes them a little more confident because they've bought in. Um, David, you've had quite experience, a lot of experience too of selling formats in, or into America. What, what was that like? Was it difficult? Uh, it was soul destroying on, on so many levels. I mean, the, the Americans are great at making you feel like this is the one and you, you're great. Um, and, and then you never get the next call. Like, like that happened so often that we, we were just gobsmacked by it. You know, we were like walking out of those meetings going, we have another one. And, uh, and you, you just never get the call. It's like, holy shit, you know, what is going on with these people? You know, it, it was quite a bizarre scenario. And, and I mean, we, we met with um, Mike Dunnell, who, who was um, heading up Fox uh, reality at the time. Now, Mike bought the block um, and they turned it into a show called The Complex. And it was complex, let me tell you. Um, and, and they completely destroyed the format, like just completely destroyed it. Right, to, to give you an example, Julian and I watched uh, an episode of the American version, The Complex, uh, which is in English. We watched it. We got to the end and we said, I'm not quite sure what happened in that episode. And then we watched the one that they made in the Netherlands. Couldn't, didn't speak a word of English. We got to the end of it and we, we know exactly what happened in that one. And, and, and that was the, the difference of, of, of what went on with those things. And Mike Darnell, when we met him, because we went in to pitch his, his show, to his credit went, boys, I'm really sorry I fucked up your show. And we're like, thanks, Mike. All right, let's, let's start pitching some new things and get on with it from there. But it's, it's really hard there. You can't get in unless you have a, an agent. They won't talk to you directly with feedback. They'll go through the agent and then back to you. So, you know, it's like Chinese whispers that go on. And at the same time, you're trying to refine the format to the point that they're going to buy it or, you know, work out what changes they want. What's the hot point? What's not? You know, it's a really, really difficult thing to do. Um, certainly educational. I'll give you that. Having said that, you did um, make the show with Marco Pierre White. You did manage to get form up, you know, original ideas up in America. What was it like to make them there? Uh, it it was really interesting. There, there was a there was a day because we 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 shot with Marco Pierre White. And we we got two restaurants in New York uh, that were competing against each other, and. And Jules and I, well, first of all, we went to, to the meeting and, they, and we had a list of crew and we looked at them and we were looking at each other going, who are all these people? I don't know, like, there's like 150 people on the crew. We're like, we, like, we made the first series of the block with seven people. Like, <laughs> it, it was small, right? And, and these guys got hundreds of people. Like, I don't know what these people do, you know, a, a lot of the time. And we were just pitching in, just carrying things and people were like, don't, what are you, don't, don't pick things up. What are you, you know, that's not your... It was really quite a surreal thing to go through, and a, and a, but a great learning experience for it because at the end of the day, the, the, dealing with the network executives there, you, you are selling every second of the day. Even once you've sold the show, you're still selling, and you're selling even after it's gone to air. And, and it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a truly fascinating uh, process to go through over there. Um, Deb, you've been on the other end of it, making formats that have come from overseas. What's your experience in dealing with, you know, the format rights holders? Oh, they're very protective. They're so <laughs> protective. It's a bit of a nightmare. You try and keep them busy somewhere else in another room if you can half the time. Um, they often, 
although intellectually they understand that we have to adapt it for our local market, they don't like it. And um, they, they, look, they are great, but it's their baby and they've often put a lot of work in it and they're very passionate about it and they're not just going to hand it over to you to David's point of what he went through and just see some other show appear. They want to have a lot of control. So it, it, it is demanding, but it's doable, obviously. And, Chloe, and I, uh, sorry, Dave, uh, after you. Just to Deb's point, I, I have to say, though, also um, that we learn a lot from what other um, nationalities do with our format. Like yes. we, we yeah. learn a lot from it, you know, and go, that, that's a really clever thing to do. And then we'll adapt it back to our culture and our audience as they will do to theirs. Yes. And that's something that is, is really good when you've got a very strong network within the company and you can look at what other territories are doing. I remember when I was doing um, a deal and the US did this thing, which I thought was fantastic. It was called Secret Deal. They had the wife playing the main game on the set and they had the husband backstage playing another game. And at the end, a deal brought out a case and said, well, who do you think is going to have the better deal? Will it be you or your husband? It was Secret oh. Deal. And I saw that once and I was fantastic. So I started doing it. So you're absolutely right. Sometimes other territories just put a really lovely spin on it that still sits nicely within the format. It doesn't, um, you know, it's not too odd. It doesn't break the format in any way, but it's just a really lovely spike. And I think if you've got a long running show, you're looking for spikes all the time. Mm. Chloe, I was just going to ask you, what was it like for your guys, you know, making say no activity in the United States? How did that go? Yeah, I think it was a, I think it was a really great experience for them. Um, at that stage, both Trent and Patrick uh, had some experience in the US, but were really sort of just breaking over there. And I think they really relished in the opportunity to be able to take a show that was essentially very low budget in Australia and have the full bells and whistles of the American system swing in behind them. So, you know, really large writers' rooms, lots and lots of joke writers, um, you know, punching up the script, lots of drafts. Um, and also, you know, um, the US show was able to cast the likes of Will Ferrell and Amy yes. Schumer and, and, and so many great actors over there. I think they just enjoyed every every step of it. And in terms of their creative um, footprint on the show over there, it was very much in their voice. So they very ma much maintained the creative vision um, that they had. Of course, they were adapting it for the US market. They weren't trying to make the Australian show there. They were trying to make the jokes work and land for that market. Obviously, the US and Australian comic sensibilities are slightly different. So um, they certainly didn't have their head in the sand in that regard. Um, they knew who they were making it for, but they really, really enjoyed that ride. Yeah. There's a question here for you, actually, Chloe. How do you pitch a comedy? Do you need a script or is a proof of concept video better? I think it's what you were referring to before that the show, the, the show itself. Yeah, so we, we do both. Sometimes it's a script that leads and other times it's a proof of concept. I think whatever can show, in, specifically for a comedy, um, whatever can show the, the comic tone um, the best is, is a great tool. Maz, were you going to add something there? I saw you going, hmm. <laughs> no, I was just completely agreeing with Chloe. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think too that one of the things that I just wanted to talk a bit about before we wrap it up is how flexible formats are in times of COVID. Um, and I think both with the block and with the chase, and we've got, um, I've got a little clip that we're going to play um, to talk about the sort of flexibility of formats uh, in, in times of COVID. So let's play the clip, please, from... Um, from uh, Beat the Chasers. You're invited to the massive primetime event. Together, they should be unbeatable. Australia's most formidable brainiacs. Who's brave enough to take them on? All at once. It's never happened before in Australia. For record money. $150,000. <laughs> This is Australia's greatest quiz challenge. Game on. Beat the Chasers this November on 7. 
So, Deb, tell us a little bit about that show first because it's sort of come out of the chase, hasn't it, obviously? It has. It's from the same creator. It's Potato, Michael Kelpie, Potato. And uh, that, I think, was about two years in the making. And and the, the beauty of that, if you love the chase, is that you see all of the chases play together for the first time. Normally, it's just one chaser per night. So it's it's also, when I spoke earlier about a format and execution, you look at the scale of that. It's the scale of that that just makes you go, wow. It's, it's, it's not a huge show in terms of, of what the format is, but the scale and the drama and all the rest of it is all a big part of it. It makes it exciting. It's an arena and it's a game being played in a, an arena. So I think that's always really important if you are developing a quiz or a game show to think about that execution, think about what it's going to look like and where those points are. The interesting thing for me about this show in particular is that the set is in Sydney and the control room is in Melbourne. Mm-hmm. So that's the first time that I have done that. I, I did a lot of sport in the 90s and we used to do that. We would downstream and, and the game might be interstate, but the control room would be here. It's the first time I've ever done it in this genre. And the way we're doing the chase at the moment is the same. The control room is here in Melbourne and the set for the chase is in Sydney. So all of the contestants, the chaser, the host, everyone is there, but the game engine, the uh, crew, the control room crew, and the questions, uh, all in Melbourne, all in wow. Melbourne. And it's actually working. It's, it's quite extraordinary. I thought that we would have a problem with our final chase because that's against the clock. And I thought we might have that delay that you get uh, when you're on a phone, you know, long distance, whatever. But we haven't, we, we managed some brilliant people building the game engine, managed to work around that lag and it and it really is next to non-existent. So it's a fantastic way to keep a crew that's been working on the chase for five years, the majority of them employed. It's very sad for the studio crew, of course, but then there's work in Sydney as well. So it's really, really good. That's it's amazing. Probably, yeah, it is. It's, it, it's still, I remember the first few times we were recording and I'm, I'm in the control room looking at the studio, I'm thinking, Who's that on the set? I haven't seen them before. Then I realised, oh, it's a Sydney crew. I don't know them. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, it's been quite remarkable, but very, very successful. And it shows you the versatility of how a format can be in difficult times. It does. And we had to do that in the end because we were recording in the very sort of heightened time of COVID and we just couldn't get contestants. We were we were look, trying to follow the postcodes and the hotspots and cancelling people and trying to book other people. We were trying to be very considerate about the demo that we were picking um, and trying to keep people within, at the time, a 5K radius. We were sending uh, Ubers to pick them up that were being deep cleaned after and trying to do all of this stuff. And in the end, it was actually easier to put the set on the back of a truck and send it up to Sydney. It really was. And then, David, sell in your world, sell it for two million bucks at the end. Yes. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you had big problems with COVID as well, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. We we um, we had to shut down for six weeks um, in in order to um, send everyone home and and um, be with their families. And then they came back. Luckily, we finished shooting a week before the second. Uh, big shutdown in Melbourne, but uh, the good thing about the block is that is is going to that point of uh, what Deb was saying is is you know if you've got a long running series, it's being able to make it interesting but not lose the audience that you've got. You know, so so because if you're just giving the same thing, then you know they're, they're going to get bored. So <clears throat> you got to <clears throat> excuse me, you got to find that line that is new and interesting yet holds on to where they are, and the block is you know. Thankfully, Channel 9 gives us a lot of rope to, to, to make this show. And um, <clears throat> we had a, the situation this year with COVID meant that we could actually record actual people going through the fear and, and, and the anxiety of COVID as it, as it unfolded in real life. And we were able to play that as part of our story, which is a really unique thing for us to do. Um, and it, because most shows don't have 
you know, th that flexibility to, to show a, a real life response to something with, with, within the confines of the show. Because most of the, these shows, you know, it's concentrated on the bubble that is the story. Whereas with the block, we can afford to go well outside that bubble. In fact, break the bubble and, and you know, break the fourth wall, which we, we do on a, on a regular occurrence uh, to, to keep it interesting. Um, and then when it comes to the auction, <laughs> yeah, we've all been. I've had lots of people saying, "Ask him what, how are you going to do the auction." Yeah, can, can you ask him for me too? Because I'm not quite sure yet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, we got we've got we've got strategies and plans in place for it, you know, because you know, online auctioning is a big thing now. Um, so, so you know, that that will definitely be a part of it. But I have to say, you know, the the way the world's moving at the moment, like it's the start of October now. We're still not looking to do the the auction for another six weeks. Like things just shift so astronomically in six weeks that, that you know, we, we put a new contingency in every week just in case um, to, to get to where, where we'll go. It, it, it'll get to where and it'll be fascinating and absolutely nail-biting for us because, you know, we have to turn the entire show around in, you know, less, less than 24 hours. <sighs> Wow. Now, just to uh, to finish up, um, the there's a couple of things I'd like to ask you about, but particularly, if I, I want to know what makes an Australian small idea have any chance at all of working in outside markets. So, Chloe, I'm going to pick on you first. What do you think it is that Australia brings to the market with little ideas that can go huge? Yeah, so I think we have, and I'm just speaking to narrative drama here, but yeah. I think we have brilliant writers, brilliant actors and brilliant technicians in this country. And I think we have the ability to um, make something at quite a reasonable price point. And as I mentioned earlier, I think it really is the tape or the original show that is the best selling tool, the best marketing asset that producers can have to, to sell that format internationally. So um, from my point of view, um, it's just really, you know, reaching for the stars in terms of the, the depth and quality of the idea and then, you know, trusting that we have great people here um, and, and that that will travel and, and the world will see that. And, and yeah, so I think bank on our great um, cast crew and IP. Deb, I'm going to ask you because, again, you're, you've, you've created your own shows and, and you've worked with a hell of a lot of international shows. What do you think that the Australian way of doing things, what sort of ideas could that sort of develop in quizzes that may not have been thought of even overseas? I think we have a great work ethic in our industry. I think we really do. We don't, um, and, and there's a lot of lateral thinking, which is great as well. Um, and, and we've especially been that, through that this year where COVID has just kept trying to put roadblocks in all the way. and We've managed to work around it and keep going. We couldn't have done that if people didn't want to participate in the solution and just were fixated on the problem. So I think there's a lot of really good thinking, uh, creative thinking, but I also think Australians love a game. They love to have a bit of a game. They love to test themselves as well. So when you think about a lot of the, the good game shows and even quiz shows, they're often very simple ideas and there's a lot to be said for that. Keep it simple, stupid, as they say. If you, if you overcomplicate it, it's it, you're too tired to sit down and try and work out what the hell this game is and how do I play it and can I win? So... If you can keep it simple, keep an energy to it and think about the execution, what it's going to look like and how it feels to play along, then I think you're really on the way. And just keep playing it, play it and play it because it'll either get better and stronger or it'll start to fade out because it wasn't strong enough. Great advice. Dave, you, what, what, what is, well, you know because you've taken it to the world market, but what's your thinking? Look, I think. I have a I have a dilemma with the way this question was kind of phrased at the start, which is, you know, what do us little Aussies have to offer the world? No, 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 not little Aussies. I'm talking Aussies are particular people with a particular. Um, I agree. But it, it, is definitely, <laughs> it, it is definitely Aussie mentality that we are the underdogs. Like, you know, right. it, it's always that. <laughs> my, my point is, a hundred people will tell the same story a hundred different ways. 
And, and what's important here is how you tell the story. It may not be an original story. It's just that you tell the story better. And what, I, what, what is great about Australia is, is, is our environment, how we grew up. Like, like I grew up in New Guinea. I, I didn't have a television until we were 15 years old. My education was spaghetti westerns, Chinese kung fu films that that had no subtitles, so I had to learn to read people's expressions and, and camera shots to work out what the story was. And it was English horror films that, that, and comic books. That that's my storytelling, you know, uh, that I have. So so out of those hundred people, when I tell a story, that's the that's the lens that I tell the story through. That's the important thing here. You know, it's it it's how you tell your story. It's it's not it's a big story. It's a little story. It's it's your story and you telling that story in a really interesting, fascinating way that no one else can tell because they don't have the same circumstances and situation that you've been through. That's a perfect rap, but I'm going to go to Maz for a next perfect rap. What, what are you, you've worked in LA, you've worked in the UK and you've worked in Australia. What little things does Australia bring to the world that doesn't exist anywhere else? Uh, so I'll just go through, I think, the advice that I would give anyone who's listening who is interested in pitching a format. Do the same as everyone else, do it better. So I made the X Factor and the voice came along. They did what we were doing. They were better than us and they beat us. And I still hate them so much, I can't tell you. But they did what we were doing. They were better than us. Or you do the exact opposite. So we're all making big shiny floor shows and shows like Gogglebox come along. And they are the exact opposite of what's available, which is really nice. Because sometimes if you're having fine cuisine, you think, I'd really like a cheese sandwich. Do the opposite. Do the same as everyone else do it better. Do the opposite. The things that I think really work coming from Australia are what I call low-hanging fruit. There's an enormous amount of stuff that can kill you here. We love little animals like cute to killers. Stuff that can kill you is uniquely Australian. I remember arriving and uh, the first show I did was Big Brother. And I got um, an email that said, if you're going down to the house today, wear boots because there are brown snakes. And I said to the person next to me, what's that about? And they said, oh, brown snakes will kill you. <laughs> what? I've just come from Notting Hill. <laughs> you know, any things that kill you in Notting Hill, people with guns, I couldn't believe it. Uh, the other thing that I would think about very carefully is this. What exists at the moment that you can tap into? So there is so much archive kicking around. Think about price points. We did um, a show, I didn't do it, and it certainly wasn't my idea, but um, I'm adding myself to it here because I'm clever like that. Uh, a show called Walk on the Wild Side. And we were at the BBC and we said, let's try and rework all the stuff that we have. And one of the things we realized we had an enormous amount of was wildlife footage. And someone very, very clever said, why don't we give it to comedians and get them to voice it and make it a comedy? Now, all of that stuff is sitting in the cupboard somewhere. Have a think about what's sitting in the cupboard at the networks and what you can use it for. Is it a quiz show? Is it a comedy? You know, what can you, is it a drama? What can you do with it? So have a think about that, because that will come in, I think, at the right price point. Uh, and it's kind of low-hanging fruit, and I love low-hanging fruit. I love you all. That was awesome. Thank you so much. So now we're going to leave the big conference room that we're in, and we're going to go into a little Zoom room so that people who would like to ask questions that I didn't ask, and God knows there'll be a million of them, can join us there. But in the meantime, thank you, guys. You're just bloody legends. I love you all. Thank you. See Thank you next you. time. Bye. <laughs>